Today we have with us a friend of mine and someone who has been on this podcast before, Christine Kamaford. She has written most recently the book Power Your Tribe, Create Resilient Teams in Turbulent Times. If you're watching the video, this is what it looks like. Uh, Christine was on uh, talking about Smart Tribes, which was an earlier book that she'd written. Uh, she is a leadership and culture coach. She specializes in applied neurosciences. So she brings science. She also has uh, you know, a, a, a background in business, in entrepreneurialism. She started uh, many companies and she worked as an engineer at Apple. Were you an engineer? Um, Apple and Microsoft and Adobe. Yes, I'm an engineer. So, so, you know, she comes at this in, you know, a really interesting way as like an entrepreneur, as an engineer, as a scientist, as a, as a businesswoman, and as an author and thinker and researcher. So, Christine, welcome to, welcome back to the Bregman Leadership Podcast. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. It's awesome to be here. So give us a quick overview of Power Your Tribe. Like what, what's the main idea in this book that you're really wanting to get out there? Thank you. So emotional resilience, the ability to choose our emotional state is what this book is about. Since 90% per NYU, Columbia, Stanford, Harvard, UCLA, Carnegie Mellon, since 90% of our decisions, of our behaviors are driven, are dominated by our emotional brain, we need to actually start paying attention to how am I feeling? Does this feel good? Does this feel bad? And helping our people understand how they're feeling and choose the best feeling behavior on the behavioral menu. Because the human being will always reach for the best feeling behavior or the least bad, if there isn't a best feeling choice, behavior on the menu. And so if accountability doesn't feel good, they're not going to choose it. If innovation doesn't feel good, they're not going to choose it. So as leaders, it's our responsibility really to help our people choose the emotional state that then drives the behavior and the beliefs and the identity that feels best. That's what the book's about. Great. I, I, I love both how our work sort of coincides and intersects. Uh, and also, I've got a million questions, which we'll, <laughs> which we'll explore. But first, I'm sort of curious about you, and I'm curious about your life. You've been on such an interesting journey. As I said in the intro, you know, you've, you've played so many different roles, and now you're really talking about sort of emotional resilience. And I'm curious about your life and your experiences that led to this book. Like what – like was it – was it successes? Was it walls that you ran into? Were it challenges? Like, and maybe, you know, if there's a story to encapsulate it, I, I'm just, I'm curious to get a feel for that. Uh, both successes and failures, you know, pain and triumph. Um, if I kind of look at, at how this all began, I started studying human behavior when I was 15. By the time I was 16, I was totally world weary. <laughs> and I became a Buddhist monk at 17 because I was like, I don't get this stuff. This doesn't make sense. I'm just going to meditate. And seven years of, you know. Wait, so uh, at 17, you became a Buddhist monk? Yes, 17 to 24. Yeah. And, so, and what, did that, you know, what does that even look like? like what, yes. So, yeah. Well, it looks like celibacy. Uh-huh. Um, it looks like a bunch of vows, <laughs> a lot of meditating, a lot of service work. And um, it was so much easier to do that because I didn't have to really deal with people very much. <laughs> right. So you were struggling with dealing with people and it's like, I'm just going to, I'm going to step away from people for a little while. And then I went from yeah. there to be an engineer at Microsoft, which was another type of monastery. Right. Right. And so, so Can finally I ask you a I question? Can't... Sorry. I'm still, I'm still yeah. on this Buddhist monk thing. <laughs> Where were you a Buddhist monk? Yes. In, uh, in San Diego and in LA Tibetan Buddhism. And so you were in a, you lived in a Buddhist center or you? No, um, we lived and worked in the world. Women lived in separate places, you know, from the men. And then we came to the center every night and we, you know, taught classes and meditated and did Got service it. work and blah, blah, blah. Got it. And um, did you learn a lot about your emotions in meditation? Like, was that a piece of it? No. See, huh. it was all about transcending 
up and out. Uh, and I, I, I got to a point where I was like, wait, this is the wrong direction. I think we need to go in and down. Right. And they're like, no, Christine, you need to transcend. You're, you're just a novice. You don't you're understand. above, you're beyond your emotions. You're yeah. right. And I was like, I don't think I know my emotions yet. I think I need to go in and down. Right. So, so I, I broke my vows ultimately at 24, you know, became an engineer at Microsoft. And I came back to the quest I started when I was 15 of like, okay, what does all this mean? Not escaping it to kind of the world of spirituality, but where is God? And like the world is my monastery. Right. And, and that's when I really got, whoa, I need to figure out emotions and relationships because I don't know how to do them. Well, and you had taken yourself out of that conversation for five or six years. So, and then arguably as a software engineer, you know, you're, you're, you're still interacting, you know, you're, you're having to interact with people, but you're still doing a lot of interacting with computers and with code and with, and so you're, you sort of took yourself out of that conversation, but then you realized what made you realize that you were lacking that? What made you realize that you needed to go down and, and deep and, and actually grow your sort of emotional life? Yes. So um, at the monastery, I just saw a fair amount of dysfunction. I saw people that weren't dealing with their stuff. And, you know, had life traumas that they weren't really processing and working through. And there was sort of a denial thing. And that's right. when I thought, hmm, I'm probably doing that too. I don't want to do that. You know, I want to deal with my stuff and be free of it. Right. So it's interesting because just even in terms of, you know, for listeners who like, like there's a lot of people, you know, when I'm coaching leaders who aren't aware of obviously what they're not aware of and they're not aware of their emotions sometimes. So what you did in that moment was you're kind of looking at other people and you're using them as a mirror, which I think yep. is often very useful. Yes. Um, so, okay. So then you're at, in Microsoft and you're at Apple. Why do you leave there? <sighs> Microsoft, this was a, a famous story a long time ago, but Microsoft got busted by the IRS and the Employee Development Department for mm -hmm. having a bunch of contractors that actually looked like employees. Right. So I was a contractor, so I scooped up 35 of them, and I said, I'll just start a company. You, you know, guys can all work for me. So that was one of the companies that I started, and um, – and then suddenly I'm like in this, you know, leader role, right? This boss role. And I'm like, whoa, you know, right. and that was, <laughs> I was trying to run a company with 35 people and at night and still work at Microsoft during the day, which was unrealistic because, right. you know, right. it was 12 to 14 hour days anyway. Um, so I, it was time to leave Microsoft and just run this business. And then the business expanded, 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 you know, et cetera. Right. And then. I just, I just did a side gig at Apple for a while because they needed some help uh, restructuring their uh, manufacturing systems. And I said, well, I can help. And it was just kind of a contract gig. And I did right. that for a while. And that was fun. And that I could do nights and weekends. Um, but yeah, so just entrepreneurship helped me discover, seriously, it helped me discover who, who I am. I right. really think it caught, it pushed me to my edge. It helped me find all my edges of, um, where I was and was not emotionally intelligent right? and how to enroll and engage people um, in totally new ways because I'm, at Microsoft, it was just Bill Gates said it and we did it or otherwise it was intimidating, intimidating I'm, us into getting it. I'm curious in that stage as an entrepreneur, when you're building up the company, you suddenly have 35 people and you're like, whether emotions are on your mind at all, or you're just like, how do I survive this? Or how do I build this? Or like, are you... Is emotions really a part of the conversation or is your focus on, you know, the outcomes you're trying to achieve with the organization, how to keep it afloat, how to grow it, how to make it successful? Um, both. Both. Um, I have to say throughout my 30s, it was very much heads down, made the company successful because I, I built – five other companies and took them public or sold them. And it was very heads down. And I have to say, Peter, um, I've only really taken the emotional intelligence stuff really seriously, really seriously over the past, gosh, 10, 15 years. And why? Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Well, my dad died uh -huh. and that was pivotal. That was pivotal. And uh -huh. he died in 2003. And that was a big one. Yeah, yeah. Let's make that a marker right. because I started writing about my life, trying to understand my life and all the stuff came up and yeah, 
2003. You know, it's interesting because it's like it's it's like we hit. It's almost like the the way into emotion is when it's so powerful you can't. You can't translate. You can't ignore it. You can't say like, oh, I'm just going to work through this one. It's like even if I'm really used to working through stuff, something happens and it, it's almost like you realize you're a human being and, and that as a human being, like it's not just about like getting a bunch of stuff done or it's not about coding or it's not about leading even. It's like I'm a human being. And so this yeah. is part of what it means to be a human being. And, and now I've got to face that. Yes. And. And I did have two cancer scares earlier than that, like 1991, where I started going, whoa, and then um, uh, 1995, and mm -hmm. I went, whoa, you know. Wow. So I started to open my eyes, but really helping my dad die um, was big. And I started becoming a hospice volunteer in 1998. Did you just say, did you use the language helping my dad die? Yes. Right. Can yeah. you explain that? Because I think that's really yeah. profound. Okay. Um, so I've been doing hospice work for the past 20 years. Mm -hmm. I help people die. I've helped 42 people die. And helping a person through the death process where it's, you know, dignified and peaceful and there's closure and you're just holding them and honoring their experience is a really sacred, beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. And doing it with patients was one thing, you know, as a volunteer. Right. Doing it with my dad was another because we had stuff that we had to work through and he had all of it. And he's like this big macho guy and he had like some fears and, you know, so, um, so using some of the tools that we'll talk about today, the emotional resilience tools, the reframing tools, <clears throat> pardon me, really helped my dad through the process, but also helped me get more in touch with myself and also helps me with my hospice patients. And my mom now is going through the death process. So I'm using them again with my second parent. Right. And and you're not just talking about your own emotions. You're talking about their emotions. So you said yeah. like you've got your own emotions that are going through it and you're helping them to process their emotions. And now you're not just a human being feeling things. You're kind of a couple of human beings feeling things or you're a gaggle of human beings feeling things. <laughs> and and yeah. that that's – and real things, you know, like real life and death things. And – and it's you, you, it's sort of hard not to wake up and look around you in an organization that's very professional and that often keeps emotions at bay and realize all of these other human beings are experiencing all of this stuff in their own lives in whatever way they're feeling it. And we could, you know, in some ways you talk about transcending it in Buddhism. In some ways we try to do the same thing in organizations. But the but the reality is you can look around and, you know, every single person listening here, walk, go into work, go, go in your family. Like you look around and it's like all these human beings feeling all these things that maybe they feel like they can talk about and maybe they feel like they can't. And is it safe yeah. in our culture to talk about them and to work through them and to just say, wow, I'm really overwhelmed. I need some help not a sign of weakness. You know, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed. I need some help. Can somebody please help me? You know? Great. Yeah. So let's talk about these tools. So, so, so it's, and, and I love hearing, thank you for sharing about your life and, and how it kind of relates to this work. It feels important. And I'd love to hear, you know, cause you talk about safety in the book and I'd love to hear, you know, some tools that people could take out that might help all of us move through the journey that you've kind of been moving through. Yes. Um, okay. So there are seven steps to emotional resilience. And here's the difference between emotional resilience and emotional agility. Resilience, you, you fall down and you bounce back up. Okay. Agility is once you've gotten resilience down, agility is, oh, here comes something. I'm just going to move maneuver through it. I don't have to fall down anymore. Right. And um, so there are seven steps. So the first is like releasing resistance to whatever it is that's happening that you are pressing against. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so that one is a lifetime. So what do you do in the second <laughs> lifetime? I mean, it's really one of the hardest things in the world to do, right? Which is that, I mean, I, I can't tell, I mean, how many people say, oh, I'm angry. And they say, well, you know, you just have to let go of your anger. Well, how do you let go of anger? Like, you know, how do you let go of love? How do you let go of, you know, the resentment? How do you forgive? Like these, uh, this is... 
We're going in there, brother. Okay, so here's the thing. I'm not even going to go – forget step two. Okay, let's just deal with resistance for a second. So um, – and yeah, it's the worst when you're angry, sad, whatever, and someone says, oh, don't feel that way. You're just like, seriously? Right. Seriously? Yeah. So we always want to honor somebody's experience. So here, here is, here's a tool that we use called maneuvers of consciousness because I want people to see how tremendously resilient they are. Everybody just jot this down or just pause as I go through each step. Step one, negative evaluation. Set your iPhone or Android for three minutes. You're going to unload about, this is what's bad about this experience. This is why I'm resisting it. This is what's unfair about it. This is what I hate about it. You have to pour it out. Right. You've got to go into that dark place. Right. I three hate minutes. that person. I hate that person. Arr, They're arr, a arr. jerk. Right. Yeah. Okay. Arr. Got three it. minutes. You have to keep going. Okay. After three minutes, you're gonna you're gonna look at the emotion wheel. We're gonna put that up on your website. I'm angry. I'm bitter. I'm resentful. You're gonna pick whatever emotions on the emotion wheel. Then you're gonna shake it out. Okay. Jump up and down. Shift your body a little bit. And then step two: curiosity. Three minutes as well. We're starting to become the witness. Step back. Huh. I wonder how this came to be. Now we're curious about the situation that we're right. resisting. What's interesting about it? What's familiar about it? What good things might come from it? What would somebody think of it from this position, from that position? So now I want to make curious. a distinction. Are you curious about – you said you're curious about the situation. Are you also spending that time curious about the person and what's going on for them or you're just curious about the situation that you're in? You're curious about your experience. Your experience of the situation. Yeah. Okay, great. If you run out of material, then you can go into, I wonder what it's like to be them. I'm curious right, right, about right. that. Right. If you run but out really of material, stick with we yourself. Want you, we want you dealing with your stuff. Okay, right. so three minutes, ding, ding. Look at the emotion wheel. Now I'm feeling pensive. I'm feeling, you know, whatever. Right. Um, and then again, shake your body out, jump up and down a little bit. Step three, amazement. Wow, I'm so kind of amazed. Like, what's fascinating about this experience? What's amazing about it? How do I feel about it? It's kind of amazing that a company could even operate and have these challenges. So what if you they know? say, because I can imagine people doing this and go, you know what's amazing? What's amazing is that this person is such a jerk and they're still here. What's amazing is that they haven't learned, you know, so I can imagine that it goes from, you know, the full expression to curiosity right back to sort of blame and rejection. And, I'm, and yeah. how do you help us out there? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so an amazement, we don't want to be in judgment. We actually want to be in fascination. Mm -hmm. You know, it's amazing that, um, an organization can have business practices like this and still be in business, you know, without the edge. It's amazing that a person could still get promoted with that. There must be something else that's really remarkable about that person. I see. So you, know? you could still look at the thing and say, I'm amazed that that person is still here, but, but, but not, not in judgment so much as saying, huh, I wonder what that's about. Discernment. Right. Yeah. Judgment without condemnation right. is discernment. Right. It's a good fallback. <laughs> so three minutes judgment, of amazement. Hold on. Let me repeat that. Judgment without um, condemnation is discernment. It's interesting. That's my, that's my definition of discernment. Right. I like it. That's just a Christianism, but yeah. that's my experience. Um, right. So you can still judge, but you can't condemn. <laughs> right, right. Right, I like that. Okay, so you do your three minutes of, of amazement. You start to go, oh, I feel kind of joyful. I feel kind of such and such. Shake your body out. Last full appreciation. Three minutes of, wow, I'm so, so thankful that this experience actually happened. This is what's helpful about it. This is how I get to grow from this experience. Um, this is how you know different I feel as a result of this experience. Wow! If I hadn't had this experience, um, I might not have you know seen leadership in a new way. Whatever. Full appreciation. Right. Okay. So we go from negative evaluation. Rawr, to curiosity, stepping back a little bit, to be kind of fascinated and amazed, to then full appreciation. The maneuvers of consciousness process takes, what, 12 minutes? Right. And we mark down on the emotion wheel kind of at how we're moving through, and we go, wow, I went from totally angry and resentful to feeling peaceful and powerful. Now, what if you get to step two, and you're a little curious about stuff, but then you get to step three, and, and you know, like things haven't really changed. Like... The reality is you're sort of bitter and angry and 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 maybe, by the way, justifiably, like maybe this other person's a jerk. Like maybe this other person violated your confidence in a deep, deep way that is hurtful and you don't want to transcend it. You don't want to do like what you did in the in the monastery. 
So you don't want to like just jump over those feelings. But sometimes I imagine three minutes of expressing them isn't quite enough to move you to the curiosity and then the amazement. So what do you, how do you, how do you, what's your suggestion there? Got it. Thank you. So if you do negative evaluation for three minutes and then you find yourself sliding back into it, going back to step one, Uh go back to step one and do it for five minutes or seven minutes or until you're exhausted. Here's the thing. Reality is what you say it is. Reality is what you say it is. Shakespeare was right. that Nothing is good or bad. Only thinking makes it so. Right now, you're resisting something. You're being crabby about something. You're thinking it's unfair. It's mean. It's whatever. You're feeling victimized, whatever your stuff is, um, because there's a certain story you have around it. Joe Blow should be different. You know, well, Joe Blow is how Joe Blow is. So you can keep suffering and resisting and burning yourself out, right. or you can start to get curious about, wow, I wonder, you know, and you can you can go into Joe. I wonder, like, what would cause a person to behave like that? I wonder what would cause a board of directors to promote someone like that? You know, you can just, you know, we're trying to help you step back from the stories you're telling yourself that are wicked, painful, and frankly, ineffective. I would, I'm curious about whether it's useful, whether even an important part of this process is to have a very defined place you're coming from or intent that you're coming from that is, that is positive in a sense. So in fact, you know, like I'm, 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 I'm going through this process not just to change my emotional state. I'm going through this process to learn something. I'm going to this process to discover something. I, mean, I don't know exactly what the intent has to be, but something where changing the emotional process is a byproduct of it, but it's not necessarily the only reason to do it because it might feel a little fake if it's the only reason to do it. But if there's an intent to say learning and it becomes this byproduct of it, then it might feel more authentic. I'm curious to get your perspective. Thank you. So think of it this way. So in the negative evaluation, you're like, rawr, 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 rawr. you're in it. You're in the mud. And by the way, it Fully. probably feels really great, that part. It, it's very satisfying. Right? Yeah. It's very satisfying because, <laughs> like, you just get to unleash. You don't have to be responsible. Yeah. You don't have to be – you get to unleash. Then with curiosity, you're stepping back a little bit and looking at the situation. Right. You know, then at amazement, you're stepping back a little bit more and looking at the situation. Then with full appreciation, it's almost like you're putting your arms around it. And then what we do after maneuvers of consciousness is we do an outcome frame, which I talked about last time we were together, which is, okay, so now what would I like? What will having that do for me? How will I know when I have it? What a value might I risk or lose to get it? When, where, with whom would I like it? What are my next steps? So maneuvers of consciousness is great when you're totally stuck Uh and you're just, and you're just looking at the problem and you're just in it and you can't get out and you need some perspective. Right. And then you're turning it around. And I guess the first question you're turning it around with, which is a question that I really love and it's, I, I use slightly different language, but it's, it's the same idea, which is what's the outcome I want here? Like given all of that, and I've mm-hmm. been able, and it feels like that first step of letting it loose and you know letting it rip is super important. But then to be able to get to that place where you go, so what am I going for? And then, you know, what are, what's the likelihood of getting? How do I get there? And the second question in the outcome frame: What would you like? What will having that do for you? Is how will you feel? Oh, I feel powerful. I feel proud. I feel accomplished. You know, right. so we're, we're trying to get some distance on those painful stories we're telling ourselves that are right. causing us to suffer so intensely and choosing to look at the outcome and dive deeply into the outcome instead of just wallow painfully in the problem. Right. You know, one of the things I like about this is that it, it could feel fake to just say, OK, I'm going to switch my mindset. But you're 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 not doing that. Right. You're saying okay, I'm, I'm bringing people through a process. I'm bringing myself through a process that allows me to actually legitimately move through these steps. I'm not going to shortcut the process, but I might speed up the process or be you know, uh, disciplined and deliberate about going through a, a number of steps around them so that I can, you know, I can kind of change my state of mind and also maybe take an action that's going to be more productive. So what you just said, let's, let's, let's package that beautiful chunk up. And this is a way to help people reframe. 
change the story, change the meaning, change the belief, change the behavior. Example, my dad was really mad when he was diagnosed with stage four metastatic all over his body, um, pancreatic cancer, started the pancreas, went everywhere. Oh, we sorry. did maneuvers, okay? Yeah. And he was like, rawr, rawr. he spent about 10 minutes in negative evaluation, actually. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm only 10 minutes? I mean. <laughs> yeah, well, he had been doing, he wasn't ready to, he wasn't ready. Yeah, yeah. Do it until we were at four months before he died. So right. he had seven months of pure negative evaluation. Right, right, right. So <laughs> it's seven, seven months, seven months and ten minutes. That sounds more well, legitimate. He did it seven months, and then I said, "Are we now ready to do this okay. process?" Okay, now I'm ready to do the process. Got it. So in the process, we did ten minutes. Anyway, so um, from that, he was then able to look at the story he was telling himself. You know, feel what the pain was, choose a different story. And then share that new story, which changed his entire last four months of his life. And his new story, what well, his reframe of rah, 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 I'm so mad at God for having cancer and having to die. His new story was, wow, cancer. And he said, cancer, honey, it's the second best thing that ever happened to me. The first best thing is your mom. The second best thing is this cancer. I said, dad, that's, that's awesome. Why is this the second best thing? And he said, because it helped me open my heart. Mm. And I would rather live for however long I have left with an open heart than for a few more decades with a closed one. Mm. And he was a whole different guy his last four months of life. It was like he graduated. It was just a beautiful thing. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's a great and beautiful example. And and I, you know, the the thing I want to say is this was the first of seven steps, right? So like there's, there's, you know, there's, there's a lot more wealth of, of that, but it's, but it's really like that already is profound. Christine comma Ford, her book is power your tribe, create resilient teams in turbulent times. There's, you know, we, we, in this beautiful conversation, you know, we, we touched on step one of seven steps. So, so check out the book. And, uh, and Christine, thank you so much as always for being your full self and joining us on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. Thank you, Peter.